This is very difficult to do alone. I don't know. I see so many channels that make it look easier. I'm just like, I don't know, man. It's it's difficult. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. I am in the basement. But in this episode, we go out to the garage to brew on the Grainfather. In this video, I use the Grainfather to brew a five gallon batch of a basic pale ale, maybe into IPA territory malt bill, featuring the Jingdao hop from China. I'll walk you through the basic steps of brewing with the Grainfather all in one system. I'll share some modifications to process that I came up with over my first two brews with the equipment. And then we're gonna taste the first two brews off of the Chop and Brew Grainfather. This ain't no quick five minute review video, y'all. This is a full on Chip Walton brew day, talking to yourself, figuring things out along the way per usual. So grab a pint or two and sit back and enjoy a brew day. I'm happy to let you know this Grainfather brew day video is brought to you with support from Imperial Yeast, whose hard cider yeast bubbles is available through the end of November, 2019 at your favorite homebrew shop and ready to ferment your apple or other fruit-based libations this fall. More information at imperialyeast.com. And of course, the all-stars, the Chop and Brew Patreon patrons. Support from patrons keeps the show going strong and allows us to get out of the garage, not that there's anything wrong with the garage, and out on the road. Make your ongoing pledge to Chop and Brew now at patreon.com slash chop and brew. Here's a quick introduction for anyone who doesn't know the Grainfather. It's an electric, all-in-one brew system where you mash, drain, and or sparge, and then boil in the same vessel. Think of it sort of like a brew in a bag, but instead of inside of a mesh bag, the mash goes inside a metal cylinder with a perforated bottom. That's elevated so the wort can drain into the boil kettle out of the malt. It has a pump for recirculating wort and feeding the wort chiller. It also has a rad control panel that can be used manually or by Bluetooth for time and temp controls. The best thing, and the first thing that I loved about this time and temp control, is that you can set a delay timer for heating mash water, and when you wake up in the morning, your mash water is at temp, and you're ready to mash in, which is quite convenient. The malt bill for this pale ale is one that I've been using a lot over the past few years when trying out hops that are new, or at least unknown to me. It's 11 pounds of raw Turo, one pound of Chateau Biscuit, and 10 ounces of honey malt. I find this grist lends a clean, fairly neutral malt flavor with a bit of toast and some honey-like residual sweetness. I really like putting hops up against this malt bill to just see what their character is. Just like any other kind of brew day, you pour a portion of malt in at a time, stirring well in between pours to help break up the dough balls and get it all well incorporated. For the record, what you're seeing here is my second grandfather brew day. I didn't roll video on the first one, for which I was joined by my buddy and my grandfather guru, Paul Illa. You'll hear Illa's name referenced a few times in the video. Now we're all matched in, um, and the point of a grandfather is to recirculate your mash, but Illa suggested that you let it sit for 10 minutes first and kind of rest on its own, so that it settles and makes its own grain bed before having the force of the recirculation kind of pushing it down. The interesting thing to note here is it looks like our temperature is still at 162, even though all of this cold grain is in. That is not the case. The sensor, the temperature probe for this is actually under the grain basket, so it's probably sitting in this really hot liquid that hasn't moved yet because we've been mashing in on top of it. So after that 10 minutes when we start recirculating, you'll definitely see this temperature even out. Uh, and last time we hit it, perfect uh, at 152. So we're going to set our timer. Boom, for 10 minutes. During that time that the mash is settling in the grandfather, I get about four gallons of water going in the sparge water heater. This device is a really cool add-on to the grandfather system. Um, as you do want to have some sparge water available to rinse grains while it's draining, I may not need all of this water for sparging, but it's nice to have extra hot water just laying around in case you need it for other tasks like cleanup or maybe even topping off a boil. I learned the hard way on my first brew that you can't have this and the grandfather plugged in and working 
um, at the same time in my garage because of the, the circuits. They're all on one circuit apparently out here. So I had to run an extension cord from an outside outlet on my house into the garage to power the sparge water heater. I might figure that out for future use. If this is going to be a way I brew, which I think it is, I'll want to maybe just have both of these in here, especially if it's winter. I don't want to be running extension cords across the frozen tundra. you see the sparge water heater has kind of like a pour spout, much like a old school coffee or tea percolator in a break room. Um, that is used for like just filling pitchers and hand sparging kind of, um, which is what I did the first time. What I am going to try to do this time is I got a piece of tubing that I'm actually going to try to kind of make a fly sparge like process out of this. But there's a dial, so you're going to set your temperature, it's in Celsius, to whatever you want your sparge water to be. When it gets to there, it'll keep it warm. It's really handy dandy. It takes about maybe, if I remember correctly, it took about 25-30 minutes to heat it up. So as long as you start that as you're starting your mash, um, they'll both kind of be done around the same time, or this will at least be kind of in a holding pattern until then. Five, four, three, two. One! Time to recirc, y'all! Alright, so our 10 minutes are up. We're gonna remove the, the solid lid, as I'll call it, the one without the hole on the top of it. And we're going to first put in this um, kind of like perforated top that's gonna kind of go against the mash. What I found with both the um, the bottom gasket of the grain basket and this uh, gasket, if you get it wet, slides in a lot nicer, especially now that this has like dust and grain, grainy dust particles. But we want to just put this in pretty much just against the top of the mash. So it kind of starts showing, coming through the perforation a little bit. I don't even think I'm going to go that far down. And then you add this recirculation arm. Actually, you got to put it through the hole on this guy. Then attach it to the pump. Oh, you can hear it as soon as it made contact. Oops, make sure that this is closed, which it now is. It was open from airing out after cleaning it last time. We've got this situation where we've got a mash, we've got this top, and now we're gonna kinda use this hose as a recirculation delivery source. I believe I'm good to go. So I'm gonna hit pump <laughs> and things are gonna happen. Hopefully. So I can hear it. I think you're supposed to run the pump for a second to just kind of get it primed before you open this up. Ooh, that sounds good. I hear some noise. That's positive. And there we go. Woo! Party on! So you can see the warts running out, which is awesome. Good to know. We're going to monitor that flow here, but I also want to show you that it's not happening yet, <laughs> but as that liquid starts to recirculate through the entire basket, um, this top temperature is going to change, and the bottom one, obviously. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, hold up, y'all. I just realized a major error, y'all. Uh, my target temp needs to be 153 now that we're mashed in. Oh, man, I didn't think about that. Crap, it's been trying to heat that mash. So, yeah, there you go. Now you're seeing real-time uh, issues so the heat will obviously stay off at this point crap it was actually trying to heat the mash even though what it was really doing was just heating the bottom water I think let's see what happens if we open this flow a little bit more and really get this um, work kind of flowing through see if we can get a temperature drop man that's on me y'all 100% on Chip Walton. Here we go. We're starting to lose temperature, which is good. <laughs> Let's see if we can even out at our mash temp. So as I was saying, 
even though that number might make you think, oh, hey, it's been mashing at 160, it hasn't been. It's just a matter of where the probe is versus where uh, the mash is on top of the probe. So we've evened out at about 152. I guess I'll bump this up to 153 since it looks like it's going to kind of do a little bit of battle. It's really cold in the garage right now. You can see from the heat gauge that it's operating at about half. Now it's going to just kind of do what it needs to do to maintain uh, a temperature of 153. We're still losing a little bit, but I think they'll even out. You can see here the flow is pretty good. Uh, thus far this wort, you know, it's not clear because it's not done mashing <laughs> and recirculating, but it's running good. There's no grains in it, so I feel like we've got a nice um, clear path for the wort that doesn't involve grains being caught up in it. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to kind of like increase the flow a little bit. Let's close this up because it's losing heat. It's coming back up to temp. It went down to 150. Now it's working its way back to 153. I'm going to set a timer. Wrong button. <laughs> I'm going to set a timer. Uh, I'm just going to set it for like 45 minutes. I might mash for the whole 60, but if I got what I'm looking for after 45, or I guess 46, how about that? And we've completely evened out. 153 was a target. Now I'm going to bump it down because I actually want 152. I'll take a quick minute to explain all of this. So on the first brew, I just... Uh, Paul and I had the grain father kind of in the middle of the garage instead of along the side. And then the sparge water heater was on way on the other side. So as we were hand sparging, I was kind of thinking of how's a way that we can make this happen kind of automatically. The idea, like I just explained, is to have this tube kind of do what this guy's doing right now, but from here. Uh, the only problem is this is either kind of off or on. There's no like middle. So I got some... We got some beer tokens and some quarters. I could even use this. We're going to try to kind of like find a, a safe way <laughs> to kind of put this halfway and guide this. Or this may just be a totally wasted effort and I spent, you know, five bucks on this tube for nothing. But I think that, that we're going to figure out a way to make this fly sparge. The latter, this whole concept and this board and everything is from my brew in a bag. So before I got the pulley wench there to fully pull my brew bag out of the kettle when I was brewing on the garage floor I would use this thing and you can even see where it's marked here brew in a bag drain step so that means this board would come up here and this hook which would be on the bottom side at this level is just perfect to bring it out and hook it and let it drain as you are starting to come up to a boil um, this is the brew in a bag lift for heat step. So if I needed to bump heat in the middle of my brew in a bag mash, this step was enough to get it off the bottom of the kettle, but not all the way out, whereas this one was all the way out. So we're basically repurposing a bunch of makeshift technology. This is a home brewing, y'all, to have this like beautiful modern equipment and still be putting it into a setting that is so homebrewy lo-fi, no-buy, you know what I'm saying? So, the mash is going, sparge water is heating. You now know a little backstory on this jumbled situation. Here's a real life learning moment for you. So as I was going over to the table to get things ready for the next step, I realized the hop and troop filter is not actually in the grain father, which is supposed to be under the basket of hot mash at this point. So I'm talking with my boy Illa to see if it's absolutely necessary that it be in. I assume it is. In which case, I guess what I'm gonna do is pull the bag out, drain it, and then I could either, no, yeah, crap. Pull the bag out, sparge, Basically collect everything, dump that into a bucket, turn the heat off, dump it into a bucket, put this on, and then pour the bucket back in to boil. I think that's what I'm going to have to do. So if you buy a grandfather, or if you have one, I'm sure you've already felt this pain <laughs> before, always put this on first. Always put this on. First step in the morning, 
actually last night when I put the water into heat, this should have went in. So what was going as a fairly smooth brew day early in the morning just got a little more interesting. Man, I'm messing this brew day up, y'all. So another thing I hadn't thought about that I just realized is I've been sitting here kind of gauging this fly sparge scenario in my head in this setup. <clears throat> but <laughs> this basket is actually going to be up about right here when this happens, which means, at least for gravity's sake, this thing needs to be higher. I don't actually think it... I can get it up to the step that it needs to be at because of the limitations of the width here. So I might just have to fly sparge this one by hand or batch sparge this one by hand again and go back to the drawing board or figure out something else in my garage that's tall enough but also stable enough to pull this off. Yay! Homebrew it! It's so much fun! <laughs> and just like that, our fix. Thankfully, to my wife's chagrin, I have this rolling countertop that's been living in our garage kind of for no reason for a couple of years, and now it has a reason. I have my old school mash tun handed down from Dawson and Keeler, as you can see there, Keeler. And this guy's on top. Uh, probably not OSHA certified situation here. We will probably try to dial this in, but considering that our mash is done uh, and it's about time to start draining and sparging, this is what we got. This is what we're going to do. Let's brew this. Let us take a quick gravity reading of this recirculating work. Ooh, it is clear. Look at that. That is a nice bronzy dark gold kind of clear at first reading which is a little warm still it's uh it's definitely about 17 bricks a little shy so 1068 this beer is supposed to end at 1063 last time we did this it was 1055 so uh you would assume that after the draining and the sparging we're going to get to, we'd want to start at probably like 1058, 1057 or eight. I'm going to take a little bit of this, both so we can see it in video, but also so I can make me a little hot scotchy. I consider that first runnings. And you can see that this is just beautiful, dark gold, clean, clear. That That is a really clear, wort happening already so i'm very happy and excited about this that's a nice looking pale ale wort y'all tastes very honey very grainy and malty but that honey malt has become a favorite of mine especially with pale ales and such so yeah that's uh graham cracker uh cinnamon toast crunch honey grams going on i'm gonna kill the flow of the pump off i'm gonna kill the pump off I'm going to remove this arm. I learned that it drips a little bit. So it's always handy anytime you're doing anything on this arm to kind of have like a paper towel or a rag or something like right there. Just, I'm trying to keep this grain father as clean as possible, as long as possible. So I'm not trying to dribble like hot sugar wart down the side of it. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So this guy fits on my five gallon kettle. Whoop, whoop. So this hook goes in. It's got little, as you can see, like little divots. We've got this kind of hook grabber handle. It's got this wedged or these notched edges. And they go into these holes. I'm gonna leave the heat on for now. So what you do, is you pull this mamma jamma up. It is heavy, and there's notches, as you can see, or maybe not, at the bottom. There's these notched feet right here that go onto these um, slanted bars across the top of the body of the grandfather. So now this just drains by gravity, and theoretically, um, you would just take water from the grandfather sparge water heater by pitcher, 
and hand sparge it, which I don't know why I'm going out of my way to make this more difficult for myself, but I wanted to just see if there was a way of maybe sparging it. Um, kind of like a fly spargy method. Here you go, so I have this tube. My workaround, as far as the height, worked perfectly. We're at a good height here. Yeah, boy, that goes on. So like I said, this kind of has either like on or off. I can sit here and kind of just do like a little at a time. Um, but my idea was to try to get it to do like a slow trickle. So I'm going to try. These are looks like trying to do a quarter. Which does like a slight trickle. But I think we'd be here all day with that. Here's the beer token. And this is pretty fast still, I would consider. But maybe not. Um, but I think that's probably as slow as I can get it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's hot. Oh, look at that. Okay, and I bought one of those things. <laughs> that's not the worst. I mean, I think that's a little faster than I want it, but at this point I'm also ready to just get to freaking brewing. On the grandfather, you actually can do step mashes, which is pretty cool. You could even do a mash out, which I didn't do this time. You could ramp it up to 170 slowly um, while it's mashed recirculating, but I didn't do that. What I am going to do is I'm going to go ahead and set the heat to boil at this point because it can at least attempt to come up to temperature while it's draining at this point, just like you would uh, with all grain brewing or any brew in a bag. Go ahead and put the heat on it. Time for hot scotchy. And this is a scotch for this morning's hot scotchy. It's actually, I'm not going to take all of that, but we're pretty much at the bottom of this. Uh, it's a Caribbean cask, extra matured in rum cask, age 14 years. Oh, Balvani. Oh man, yeah. This was a gift to me uh, for helping to coordinate, I believe the first time the Minnesota State Fair homebrew competition was ever judged at Summit. Amanda and Tony and the crew gifted me this and that was really nice for, for you know, all I did was like help coordinate a room and then hang out and help judge and help clean up. But um, yeah, this is a beautiful scotch. It would be unwise of me, I think, to pour all of that in there, but I think that rums, matured scotch with the honey notes of this wort is going to be quite nice. Oh, mm. he ain't lying. Oof. Man, that tastes like brown sugar, oak, honey, mm. grain, cereal. This is a good morning. This just became a very good morning. I'm glad you were here for it. So again, this is not usual, but I think everybody comes up with their own modifications and workarounds. But again, because I can't see in there to really um, to see my volume markers, I also can't really get a spoon in through these very narrow gaps. I'm going to pick this up, which is much lighter now, and move it here. Five gallon kettle works perfectly. We're at six gallons right now. I'm gonna move the camera up so everybody can see it. We've collected about six gallons. I'm gonna do a quick read here and see if we could continue sparging or if we should just cut it now. Uh, with six gallons, I'd expect to still end up with five. The boil on these, or at least on the 110 version, is not very uh, vigorous. So you really don't have that much boil off. So our gravity reading right now is about 15 bricks, maybe a little shy. So. 1060 or a little shy 1058 that's pretty much exactly where I want to be for ending up at uh, 1063 so I'm just gonna go with what we got we may not get a full five gallons after true gloss and stuff but I'd rather hit the numbers on this one one thing I'll say about coming up to a boil is it does take a while especially on this 110 um, volt version of the grandfather and the the lid that comes with it obviously has this hole both for the recirculation and for later when we're doing wort chilling, we're gonna use this. So just to try to like be as efficient as possible coming up to a boil, I once again use that lid for my five gallon kettle, which works just perfectly. We're bittering this beer with one ounce of Triumph hops. 
Yeah, we're making beer in the garage and it's beautiful outside. Woo! The hops I'm using in this brew are mainly Qingdao flower hops grown in the Gansu province of China. I got these as a gift from the Hop of the Month Club, a program where, as you can imagine, you sign up and you get different unique hops each month with a spec sheet and a suggested recipe. According to Hops of the Month Club and other Hop Lab reports, this hop is expected to be bright and crisp with the lemon peel quality to the bitterness, distinct in the way that Saz hops are, but with some New World citrus and melon, even these kind of outlying flavors of cream and tobacco flavors. They also say British style current and earthy flavors may be present. One really cool thing that the Hop of the Month Club does is they provide these aroma packets so that you can kind of smell an aroma sample of a hop before you just tear open one of the whole ounces and they smell very kind of like um, what I would call kind of like sea hop, very citrusy and piney, but they also kind of have an earthiness. And they're definitely not one of these fruity, over the top, berry um, kind of things. I'm gonna go ahead and just pour it in for the heck of it. Yeah, we're about halfway through the boil. Woo! Five, four, three, two, one! Whoa! Yeah, boy! So with that, we're gonna put in another ounce. Of the Chinese hops. We're gonna kill the heat off. And we're gonna let those hang out while I get the chiller set up. Now that I've got the grain father kind of set up in the general area that I'm going to be using this chiller. I'm going to give this one last big stir to get all the hops worked into the wort. We're going to kind of do a whirlpool. It's going to give it a good momentum in a circular motion. And then we're going to cover it up. And then eventually the chiller will live on top of the grain father while it does the chilling which is pretty cool. All right, whirlpool away. I'll give you a real quick rundown of kind of this setup before we get chilling. So we've got the chiller and it's got an in and out to the pump system. There's a red and a blue, which is from the hose eventually here and then an out. I'm gonna collect the first bit of uh, cooling water, which will be really hot in the sparge heater. That way I can maybe heat that up and get some like really hot water for cleaning. I've also got just like a regular random work bucket here in case we wanna run a little bit of work into that or water just to have it around. And then I have the actual bucket that we're gonna be running off cool wort into. Probably an easier way maybe to do this setup, but for now these are like the components that I figured out I need. And you know, the sparge water, I don't necessarily need it, but it's nice to have hot cleanup water afterwards. Uh, and also to run back through the system with a little bit of cleaner, um, CIP cleaner, uh, and then like one more hot water rinse at the very end. Clamps are the best friend. All right, we're gonna turn the pump on. So we've got runoff water going over here into the sparge chiller. I've got the pump now recirculating into itself just to get everything kind of clean and sanitized. And then I'm going to move that over to here. <laughs> the chiller just kind of fits right on top. We've got work coming in. I'm going to close it off real quick. Pump's still running. But this, ah, oh, that's full of sanitizer. <laughs> no! Ah. We almost had some very clean beer, if you know what I'm saying. All right, so now we're gonna put this here. We'll grab a clamp, sanitize it. Bam, bam, bam. Turn the, open up the ball valve again. Now we have wort going into the fermenter. We've got 
water coming over here, which is about to be more than we need. I'm going to put it here. We might be able to use this later if need be. According to the thermometer gun, it's, it's coming out at about 75, which is obviously warmer than I would like it. Or it's coming in at 140-ish. Let's go down to 72. I opened it wide, so maybe it just needed to be wide open. We've cooled our wort. It is in a bucket now, right at about 70 degrees, a little high. So I'm going to probably let it hang out in the basement a little while today, or maybe even throw it in the fridge for an hour. So what we've got left is the grandfather and the chiller, which now needs to be cleaned. But that whirlpool, I mean, we got pretty clear wort. For some reason, the first runnings of it uh, out of the chiller got some hop funk in it. Um, but you can see by and far down here is where the filter that we had to decide whether or not we were going to bother putting in is. And I think it was a smart idea to put it in because that's, you know, three ounces of hop funk at the bottom. So now what we have to do is kind of just like swirl this up and dump it out and then make up a quick mix of some like CIP cleaner, run it through the pump, and then we're going to run it also through, uh, that'll clean out the chiller as well as the pump. And then we're going to use some hot water from the sparge heater over yonder. And uh, man, yeah. So I don't know if I'm going to document all that. I think I'm going to disconnect from video at this point and do those um, pump cleaning and chiller cleaning, sanitizing, hot water rinsing, kind of off camera. Y'all know how that goes. Um, there's other videos out there that show you all of that if you want. But all in all, I will say I've enjoyed the grandfather experience so far. Today we hit our numbers perfectly. We got five gallons of 16 bricks. Um, so 1064, 16? Yeah, 1064. So like one point higher, definitely not the 1055 that I got last time. So I'm happy with that. You know, it's a lot of, it's a little bit of juggling, but there's, Besides brewing a bag, I don't think there's any other kind of style of brewing other than extract that cuts out a lot of pieces of equipment. So this is pretty nice to be able to wake up and have the sparge water, I mean the mash water ready. Um, there's other pieces of this that I think I'll be able to dial in to making it even more efficient. But for now, it's, it's pretty cool. I look forward to more journeys and for tasting notes on this beer. Fade to tasting notes. <laughs> Here in the basement for the tasting notes. So we have two different beers. One I call Low Key Mighty Pale Ale, and it is the one with the Mighty X hops, 10.55 to 10.09, so about 6.2 Pale Ale. The Qingdao Pale Ale went from 10.64 to 10.10, .10, so it's about seven. So that's definitely pushing into IPA. The color is beautiful, nice dark orange getting into deep gold really clear the work off of this grain father in both these cases turned out some amazingly clear work both into the fermenter and definitely into the glass so i'm going to try to do this kind of lightning round style um because that video that brew day video took so much longer than i thought the low key mighty um was bittered with mighty axe xenia mighty axe is a local hop grower in minnesota and they've got a couple of varieties that I got hold of. Xenia is a house variety grown from the CTZ genetics. Um, made a name for themselves for intense, dank, and resin. Jammy orange aromas. Distinctive lack of onion garlic flavor, which I guess maybe CTZ t might have those typically. Uh, the other hop in this is Julius. Mighty Axe Julius. Transform Cascade. Hop that brews clean, modern, aroma forward IPAs, pa uh, hazy pails, We're putting a burst of fruit on top of a sour. Again, the malt bill in this is equal in both these, and I'm very used to that malt bill. So I taste the beer that I always know this is in the malt, which is good, toasty, honey. Uh, in this case, I used the low key, low key, not low key, <laughs> even though the beer is called Mighty Low Key, the low key uh, yeast from Imperial. And it fermented pretty hot, upper 80s, lower 90s for its life. So there's a couple of things that might be giving this beer the big citrus punch that it has. Huge orange. I think those Julius hops are even like one of the descriptors on their marketing is kind of like um, orange sherbet or kind of like obviously an orange Julius drink, but just a punch 
almost like a powdery, citrus, juicy, and I get a bunch of that. It's nice though, because it, it is clear, so it drinks like an old school bitter IPA. Um, very orange for it, very citrusy. For the Qingdao Pale Ale, we bittered with Triumph, and then there were two charges, uh, I believe, of Qingdao during the boil, as with the first beer as well, and then um, dry hopped as well as the first. So both of these were bittered, two drops towards like 10 and zero, or 10 and Whirlpool, and then dry hopped with one ounce at, after fermentation. The, the Qingdao is way earthy, earthy, herbal, but it still has like this sprucey kind of pine to it, both in its bitterness, but also kind of this just piney um, cut through much like a, kind of like a California hop would. I would, I would actually expect more of that from the first beer since they're kind of cascady CTZ. But this Qingdao, which is kind of supposed to be noted more for like a Zatz, it's used by a Qingdao brewery, it's spelt different, but the same name of brewery, which is obviously kind of like a, a macro lager brewery that would need a lot of sots so it's not surprising but i feel like this takes the sots that you're used to from most lagers and stuff and pushes it into a little citrusy pine both of these beers are crazy clean like really clean beers i think the process of chilling and getting it into a fer fermenter happens fast enough um that that keeps it clean the Qingdao i forgot to mention it was pitched with a jar of top cropped um, Imperial Voyager, which was basically the Timothy Taylor strain from the summer. So English ale, highly croisoning. I scooped it a couple times when it was creamy, like banana pudding looking stuff on top. And then I pitched that after um, holding it in water solution in the fridge for quite some time, pitched it directly in. And I get maybe some of that and way in the, in the depths, kind of some stone fruit, bready notes from that yeast, but by far the Qingdao come through is just really clean, uh, really piney, almost kind of sweet, and then that malt bill and that alcohol at seven, they're all kind of making it a little bit sweeter with this hot bitterness behind it, whereas the low-key mighty, I wouldn't say is nearly as bitter, it just feels like the middle and the end are filled with hops. The only real thing was just the sparge in the first brew um, following the formula kind of got me too far down in gravity and up in volume. So I would just say keep an eye on that draining and that sparging if you're going to do that, uh, just to keep an eye on your pre-boil gravity. Besides that, I really had fun with it. I look forward now to taking it away from this very similar recipe twice in a row to doing some darker beers. I definitely want to try step mashes. That's clearly one of the things that this thing is kind of built for. Um, so we might do a little Sammy Claus action and step mash it or just experiment with it. Get some different kind of beers in there and see how the grandfather plays with them. I want to thank you for watching as always. I want to thank Imperial Yeast. I want to thank Grainfather and BSG for lining up this fun equipment to play around with and all the patrons. Let me know if you're a grandfather brewer, what kind of things you learned early on, uh, maybe modded up a little bit or things that you added onto the system along the way. Um, I really appreciate it and I appreciate y'all chop for chop. Brew for brew. Cheers, cheers. I'm not drinking both of these by myself for the record. Do 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 do. Perforated. Y'all just saw me look up a word. Gansu. 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 Let's start a new track for that. Why not? I'm going to do that part looking at the camera. How about that, y'all? Clamps, 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 clamps. Is this something you'd like to share with the class? So if I stop, I'm glad I'm recording on this. If I stop, talking about the Qingdao right after the Hop of the Month Club. So I might still want to repeat that part, right? Hey, I just stuck the wrong end of the earbud in my ear. I've never done that in my whole life. All right, all right, all right, what are we doing? It's difficult to do by yourself. Okay, so what are we gonna do?
What up, Gap Tooth Mafia? I would pour some out for the dead homies, man, but uh, nah, man, I gotta keep that to myself for later on. Hmm. But wrong way. Let me zoom out and see my own face, boy. Hey, everybody, it's time to get an update from Chip Walton's flaky forehead. I think that's the end of the episode.